much. It's an honor uh, to be able to present at this prestigious forum. It's too bad that my friend, uh, Professor Lizzie John, couldn't be present, you know, but hi, Lizzie. Uh, okay, so uh, the title of this presentation is The Future of Hardware Technologies for Computing. Now, before I start this presentation, I really want to thank my students, my sponsors, and my collaborators, without whom this work wouldn't have been possible. You know, I just have the pleasure uh, to be here to give this presentation and at many other places like that, but they are the ones that did, really did all the hard work. And especially I would like to call out uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Philip Wong uh, of Stanford University. Uh, so, you know, when I joined Stanford roughly 15 years back, I met with Philip, and that's kind of started this journey of what I call nanosystems. So I'm really thankful to Philip for that. <laughs> so the early days of computing were dominated by relays, vacuum tubes, discrete transistors, and then uh, came uh, integrated circuits. Actually, this will be the 65 years of uh, integrated circuits, so, you know, 1958. So that's when Kilby uh, presented the monolithic idea and the modern day integrated circuits were born. Now, for all the students that are in this audience, I would strongly encourage you to read Kilby's Nobel lecture, where he kind of talks about kind of the genesis of integrated circuits, and he points at kind of three points that the naysayers of integrated circuits were very skeptical about. First of all, they said that the yields would always be too low to be profitable. Number two, the best devices were not made with semiconductors. What Kilby was really meaning is kind of the materials that we use in integrated circuits today. And the third one is really beautiful that the true transistor people didn't like to see their elegant devices messed up with all the other stuff on the chip. He was meaning all these capacitances and so on and so forth. And Kilby makes this point in his Nobel lecture that he didn't have a retort because you know, these people, all the points were essentially true. But uh, the big news is that, as we know today, that integrated circuits have changed all our lives over the past 60 years. So now the question really is, Moving forward, we need another leap in integration because our conventional ways of doing things are stalling. First of all, we are hitting the memory wall, which means that for almost all computations that we can think about, we spend most of the energy and the execution time trying to shuttle data back and forth between the computing chip and the memory chip. That causes the memory wall. And at the same time, we are going to hit the miniaturization wall very soon. So uh, these this, this Russian dolls that I have drawn over here, essentially, you know, you look at the five nanometer, three nanometer, two nanometer, and so on and so forth, they are all scaled by 0.7. And the point is how far are we going to go in the next 10 years, probably over here. And so this combination of this memory wall and the miniaturization wall is a deadly combination that creates many other walls. For example, we already know about the power wall, the cooling wall, the resilience wall, and so on and so forth. So given all this, the question really is, how are we going to overcome these challenges? Because to realize the dream that we heard about in the previous presentation, we must overcome these challenges. And there comes this concept of what I call nanosystems. To be able to build nanosystems, you need nanotechnologies. That could mean new kinds of memory and logic devices. Uh, but not just that. It could be new kinds of fabrication. I will you know, speak of you know, a couple of those today. Or even new kinds of sensors. But using these nanotechnologies, what is key is that we are able to build new architectures that are not possible or that are extremely difficult with existing technologies. If we just take existing architectures and we just replace existing technologies with new technologies, we will be stuck by the bottlenecks, the fundamental bottlenecks of existing architectures. So that's not going to give us much benefits because these nanotechnologies are going to cost a lot of money to be able to create these nanotechnologies. So the benefits that we get out of these nanotechnologies must be very large. And this is a key point I want you to remember through this presentation. And obviously these new architectures that enable new applications, uh, the abundant data applications, for example, AI, AR, VR, and so on and so forth for today's discussion. Now here, I want to spend a little time talking about 
uh, von Neumann and non-von Neumann, because there is a lot of confusion, and even looking at the HIPIC program, I actually saw that confusion, you know, uh, because everybody just goes and blames von Neumann for all the trouble that we are having. So there is nothing about von Neumann or non-von Neumann that has to do with this data explosion and the memory wall. Because, you know, even if you take a hardwired accelerator, which is non-programmable, and which is a non-von Neumann machine, that has the same problem of the data explosion and the memory wall. So it's not that, oh, somehow if I built a non-von Neumann architecture, suddenly my memory wall will be gone. You know, like I see that in many research papers. I even saw that in the HIPIC program. Uh, and oh, by the way, if you read the seminal paper of von Neumann, he actually talks about this. He says that ideally you want an indefinitely large memory capacity, number one, but here is a really important piece, such that any particular word would be immediately available. And now he makes a point that that doesn't seem to be physically possible, that's why you have memory hierarchy, so on and so forth. So let's not blame von Neumann and let's try to see how we can overcome the memory wall. And that's where comes this concept of computation immersed in memory. So if we look at computing today, in spite of major breakthroughs over the past 60 years, computing today is pretty basic. You actually have a two-dimensional kind of plane of transistors. Yeah, there are some wire stacks in the third dimension. So that's a compute chip. And then you have the memory chip that's sitting very far from the compute chip. You know, and you know, we have the memory wall. We, have, we spend this massive amount of energy shuttling data back and forth between the compute chip and the memory chip. Instead, moving forward, what we need is what I call this notion of NEXT 3D, where NEXT stands for Nano-Engineered Computing Systems Technology, to achieve computation immersed in memory. You have many layers of efficient logic that are finely integrated and intertwined with many layers of dense memory. You could actually have a layers of sensors, for example, on the top for augmented capability. But what you have done by building these many layers of finely integrated uh, memory and logic is that you have gotten away, first of all, from this two-dimensional plane that's going to come to an end with the miniaturization wall. And you actually achieve computation immersed in memory because you are trying to build a high-rise of logic and memory. Now, if you build a high-rise, but you forgot uh, to connect to have a lot of elevators that are connecting the various floors of your high-rise, then it's a useless high-rise. So the second important point that I want you to remember in this presentation is that while we are building this high-rise, the key point is that we have ultra-dense 3D, so that we have lots of very dense connections between these various layers so that you have millions of elevators when you are building this high-rise so that you are not stuck in any particular floor. And that's the key to achieving a 100x to 1,000x improvement in energy delay product for future computing applications. So that's the next 3D. That would be the basis for our presentation. Now, when you have one of these next 3D chips, which we might call a next 3D chiplet, then you can think about many such next 3D chiplets to create a continuum of interconnectivity. So now you're talking about a two-dimensional space where the y-axis is very on-chip dense 3D, like a next 3D that I was talking about on the previous slide, and the x-axis is an inter-chip integration continuum of these various dense next 3D chiplets, kind of the next IC or the next interconnectivity continuum. So let me spend a little time talking about you know, the various axes. I will start with the y-axis, which is like the next 3D, ultra-dense on-chip 3D. Now, when we talk about 3D integration, there is a lot of confusion in the community. So most people, when they think of 3D integration, they kind of think about what's shown on the left panel over here. So you, know, you have this compute chip, and there are lots of publications at the conferences that you know, many of us go to, where people, what they do is that they take this compute chip and they kind of fold it in the third dimension. And you know, I call that 3D folding. And actually, there are not much benefits of doing that. You know, even those publications talk about a 20%, 30% benefit, but in reality, there is no benefit. Why? Because your memory wall still continues to stay. Because you just took a compute chip and you just folded it with 3D physical design, 
into, you know, into, into three layers. So that's an absolutely terrible idea because there is no benefit of doing something like this. And unfortunately, I see a lot of papers talking about that. Instead, what you need to do is this concept of next 3D that I was talking about, which is that you fuse the memory and the compute together to overcome the memory wall and the miniaturization wall to have this notion of von Neumann's dream of all memory and all compute on a single chip quickly accessible at a very low energy. So that's the key that you want to do, and that's the key to this 100x to 1,000x energy delay product benefits. Why? Because of the dense vertical connections, you have many concurrent on-chip memory accesses, and you actually enable new architecture design points through this new uh, 3D physical design. So let's delve into the details of this y-axis now, uh, which is you know, on-chip dense 3D. Now, you know, like, it's great that this is an architecture audience. If you were a technology audience, I cracked this joke that if you get a bunch of technologists in the room and ask them, you know, which technologies do you use to implement you know, this next 3D, for example, the only answer that everybody would agree on is my technology, right? But the key point is, the good news is, you know, when you actually create a new architecture or a new system concept, you want to make sure that that works for many possible technologies that are being explored today. So it's not like a pie in the sky sort of thing that, oh, if you just pick this specific one with this other specific one, it would work, otherwise it would fail. And the good news is that with this next 3D concept that I'm talking about, there are many technologies. You pick your choice. You know, for logic technologies, and I love carbon nanotubes, we'll talk a little bit about that. But if you like 2D semiconductors, good for you. You can implement next 3D. Similarly, for memory technologies, I like resistive RAM. If you like magnetic RAM, you like oxide fets, so on and so forth, so be it. You can actually implement this next 3D concept. But so, so as I was saying, that I'll spend a little time to be concrete, rather than be hand wavy saying, oh, you can implement with many technologies. Let me show you some concrete examples, concrete implementations with specific technologies to convince you that this is next 3D is something that you can build today. And I will start with logic technologies. And for logic technologies, you know, as some of you probably know, that you know, my group at Stanford, we have spent significant resources and efforts on carbon nanotube field effect transistors. So what are carbon nanotubes? These are uh, nanocylinders of graphene. What is graphene? You know, like you have your pencil that you write on, you know, the lead in the pencil, that's a graphite. So if you can exfoliate layers and layers of graphite, you know, and then are left with one layer of graphite, that would be called graphene. And then you roll that graphene into a cylinder, a hollow cylinder, that would be uh, you know, a carbon nanotube. And the typical diameter of a carbon nanotube would be roughly around one nanometer. So uh, you take these carbon nanotubes, you, know, you grow them on a substrate, or you transfer them from one substrate to another substrate, and then you build this source gate and drain contacts, you get a carbon nanotube field effect transistor. You do not need to know anything more about carbon nanotube transistors for this talk, why? Because you know, this is a high level presentation focusing mostly on architecture and systems. Uh, but why are we looking at carbon nanotubes? This is actually a graph uh, that we worked on uh, jointly with IMEC in Belgium, as many of you know. So here is energy and here is frequency. So this is the preferred corner. You want to run it as high a frequency as possible at as, at as low an energy as possible. And you can see that compared to uh, existing transistor technologies, for example, a silicon nanosheet transistor is currently being implemented, you get close to an order of magnitude improvement in energy delay product. Versus if you look at existing ways of doing things, you get, you know, like after nan nanosheet, there is something called a fork sheet, for example, that many people are talking about. That gives maybe a 10% improvement in energy delay product. So you get a major benefit in, in a energy efficiency right off the bat. Now, if carbon nanotubes are so good, how come we don't have carbon nanotubes inside your cell phones? And that's because for a very long time, it was very difficult to build actually, you know, functioning circuits built out of carbon nanotubes because of imperfections that are inherent in these nanotechnologies. And I won't get through the details, but the good news is that at Stanford uh, over the past decade, we worked on what is called an imperfection immune paradigm that overcomes these challenges. And as a result, uh, you know, we were very fortunate that we were featured on the cover of Nature, uh, where we demonstrated the first carbon nanotube computer on this left panel. 
But even a better news is that, you know, folks from MIT and analog devices in 2019, they actually demonstrated a full RISC-V microprocessor, which was far more capable than our basic carbon nanotip computer, uh, you know, in 2019. But the even better news is that, you know, since I'm a professor, my products are my students, and the same person, this is, you know, Professor Max Schlocker, he was a Stanford student that time, you know, who built that carbon nanotip computer, and this is the same, you know, Professor Max Schulacher from M MIT who built that, you know, uh, RISC V microprocessor. So as carbon nanotube processors grow, you know, students grow as well. And the key point is, you know, uh, there are lots of advances that are happening in the domain of carbon nanotubes, many innovations along all these axes of complexity. I al already talked about this RISC V, for example. Uh, scalability, you know, uh, you know, making them scale at very small technology nodes. For example, here is this fantastic paper from TSMC. You know, and understanding high performance of carbon nanotubes. I talked about this, you know, IMEC work that, that we collaborated with. So that's carbon nanotubes. But again, you know, if you like 2D materials, you know, you can build our next 3D, for example, using uh, those 2D materials as well. Let's switch gears and talk about memory technologies. And as I was saying earlier, that one of the memory technologies that we'll be talking a lot about in this presentation is resistive RAM. But again, if you like magnetic RAM, if you like you know, oxide transistors for oxide memory, you, know, you should be able to implement that for our next 3D. I will come back to this resistive RAM later in this presentation. The key idea in resistive RAM is that instead of storing information as charge, you store information as a resistance in a dielectric between two metal electrodes. So that creates what is called an aux RAM or a resistive RAM. But as I said earlier, it's not just these technologies that matter. What really matters is how you integrate in 3D, in ultra-dense 3D, these various technologies. Now the question really is, how dense is ultra-dense? So what I'm showing on the left plot is that you know, what I looked at is the pitch between various vertical connections, you know, like a, you know, distance between various vertical connections. I picked 10 micron over here, why? Because if you look at, you know, a 3D using through silicon vias or TSVs today, those are at a level of 50 micron, right? So I, I said, okay, let's start with 10 micron. And then I'm sweeping the X axis to roughly around 100 nanometer. And on the Y axis, I'm looking at the energy delay product benefit if I implemented a whole bunch of applications, by the way, this is in simulation, and you know, from AI workloads to AR, VR, to genomics, to graph analytics, and so on and so forth. And the key point that you need to focus on is that you need very dense vertical connectivity, very dense pitch of you know, around 100 nanometer or less to be able to achieve this 100x to 1,000x energy delay product. So the key point is, you know, you need very dense vertical connections. So then how do you achieve very dense vertical connections? Now guess what? What is the, like, what is the densest vertical connectivity known to humankind? Those are actually the metal vias that are already present inside your integrated circuits to connect the various wires in the metal stacks, right? We actually have one, you know, uh, plane of transistors and many layers of vertical metal wires, and they are connected uh, with you know, these vias, metal vias, that are very dense, that are super dense. They already achieve these density numbers that I'm talking about. So then how, how come we don't build you know, transistors and memory cells in various layers of our chip? Why do we have to build transistors and memory cells in the bottommost layer of our chip? That's because something that we almost never talk about is that to build a silicon transistor, it takes 1,000 degrees C. So if you wanted to build a silicon transistor on an upper layer and connect them using these very dense vertical connections, that would be called monolithic three-dimensional integration. Then you have to build the silicon transistors at 1,000 degrees C, and whatever you built on an upper layer, everything underneath would be severely damaged. You have to be able to build things at a less than 400 degrees C to be able to do this thing that I'm talking about. And fortunately, all the technologies that I was talking about earlier these carbon nanotubes, 2D materials, resistive RAM, magnetic RAM, and so on and so forth, they can all be built at a very low temperature. So suddenly, you can build this integrated circuit chip where you have many layers of transistors, many layers of memory cells, 
you know, connected with dense vertical interconnections that are already present in today's integrated circuits. That's called monolithic 3D integration. That may not be the only way of achieving ultra-dense 3D. That is a very promising way of achieving ultra-dense 3D. So do these things actually work in real life? So over the past several years, almost at a cadence of once every year, uh, we have been able to demonstrate actual hardware prototypes that show various kinds of benefits, and I will walk through some of these in the rest of this presentation. Uh, you know, as you can see, at a cadence of almost once every year. You know, uh, and so these are like lab prototypes that demonstrate the benefits of these technologies that I'm talking about. But what I'm really, really proud of is this proverbial lab to fab. So it's not just we can do these things in the lab in some Stanford nano lab, for example. But today, there are multiple industrial fabrication facilities where these technologies that I'm talking about have been implemented. At analog devices, you know, uh, you know, thanks to my former student, you know, Professor Max Schulager that I was talking about, they have carbon nanotubes you know, integrated in 3D with silicon CMOS. And also at Skywater Technology Foundry, thanks to the DARPA 3D SOC program, in collaboration with you know, MIT, Stanford, and Skywater, we have been able to implement uh, carbon nanotube transistors, resistive RAM, in monolithic 3D with silicon CMOS, working in actual commercial silicon foundry. So whoever says that these new technologies you know, do not work in actual you know, commercial facilities, can they work? These are you know, living proofs that they are working uh, very well in actual commercial facilities. So let's look at you know, various hardware prototypes. In 2017, in Nature, this was the last chapter of Max Schulacher's thesis, we actually built a full 3D nanosystem. This was the first 3D nanosystem. Uh, you know, lots of carbon nanotube sensors that are sensing you know, data from the external world up to terabytes per second, storing it in on-chip memory, on-chip resistive RAM, a megabit of resistive RAM built at the Stanford nanofabrication facility, and having a machine learning accelerator. At that time, it was a support vector machine accelerator that's analyzing the data. So this was an integration of carbon nanotube for logic, carbon nanotube for sensors, resistive RAM, together with silicon CMOS, you know, uh, you know, sensing data, storing data, and analyzing data, the dream of so-called edge processing or IoT, uh, to show in situ classification of data which was accurate and extensive. In collaboration with UC Berkeley, you know, we actually built uh, the first you know, 3D chip for hyperdimensional computing. As many of you know, that for AI workloads, you know, neural nets are just one kind of a brain-inspired computing model. There are many other computing models, for example, hyperdimensional computing. And this particular chip that we built, and we actually demonstrated on the floor at ISSCC, this could actually learn from very few samples, the so-called one-shot learning. Uh, this chip was used for language classification purposes, you know, uh, like German versus French versus Spanish and so on. And literally at the ISSCC floor, people were training uh, this chip with very few you know, uh, sentences, and then it could differentiate between various languages, for example. So again, another demonstration built at the Stanford Nanofabrication Facility that you can actually build these working nanosystems that actually work in real life. So these were kind of you know, so-called you know, in the lab, in the Stanford Nanofabrication Facility. Now we will look at something closer to uh, more industrial stuff. So I had the fortune to work uh, you know, very closely with CEA Leti in Grenoble in France over here. You know, I had a chair in nanosystems there. And you know, uh, there, what we built, this was in ISSC 2019, where we actually built the first non-volatile computing chip with resistive RAM, with silicon CMOS, you know, all integrated together. This was you know, commercial silicon CMOS. And on top of that, CEA Leti put their resistive RAM. And the question was, what do we actually demonstrate to demonstrate the capability of these nanosystems that bring some large benefits? And this is what we demonstrated. So we actually targeted replacement of embedded flash using resistive RAM technology. And at that time, in 2019, nobody used to talk about that kind of stuff, right? And we were the first to demonstrate apples to apples compared to industrial embedded flash chip. We were able to show a 10x improvement in battery life 
using resistive RAM, and a 28x improvement in active energy. These are very large numbers for a new technology, you would believe, right? You know, you would agree. Uh, now, when you are using resistive RAM, many people worry about, you know, what about reliability? Will it actually work for 10 years? And especially in a non-volatile computing system where you are turning things on and off, which means you have to do checkpointing and so on and so forth. And we were able to show our 10 years of lifetime using these you know, non-volatile computing chips. Of course, we had to innovate. You know, my former postdoc, uh, you know, Mohammed Ali, he is now a professor in NTU Singapore. He came up with this technique called the Endurer that actually enabled this 10 years of continuous inf you know, inference. And we also demonstrated this was the first working chip where we were able to store multiple bits per cell inside the resistive RAM, and we were able to do computation on top of that. So if you look at this multiple bits per cell resistive RAM, you know, before our work, people would look at an array of resistive RAM cells and, and say, look at that beautiful cell in that array. I can store maybe three bits inside that resistive RAM cell cherry picked. Now that's a scientific advance, but you would agree that that does not really advance the field. Why? Because you have to be able to program the entire array, all the resistive RAM cells, to be able to make this storage, which means that requires new kinds of algorithms and new kinds of circuit tricks to be able to do that, and that's what we demonstrated. Uh, number one, up to four bits per cell at a full array level, but not only that, now that you have four bits per cell at a full array level, in spite of variations, you know, you would have some variability because you know you're storing analog values inside a resistive RAM cell, we were still able to show that with the proper kind of encoding of neural net weights, for example, we were able to achieve on the same hardware significantly improved accuracy. So this is key because this is so-called co-design, this kind of understanding the technology and understanding the application and how you do the right kind of encoding. People didn't used to talk about that kind of stuff in 2019, you know, February we are talking about, but today you see lots and lots of papers talking about this kind of co-design, how do you overcome RAM variations and so on and so forth. So that's kind of, you know, was one of the contributions of that ISSCC paper, you know, showing the first non-volatile computing system that shows a lot of benefits compared to embedded flash. And around that time, TSMC came to me, and TSMC said that we are going to give you access to our resistive RAM, you know, can you show something very cool? Can you actually show interesting results you know, uh, using our resistive RAM with silicon CMOS. And I told them that we were going to demonstrate, you know, resistive RAM, you know, best edge AI inference and training. And TSM said, that's wonderful. We are going to give you this access and we build this chip called the Chimera chip, which I will get into details of. But one of the points I want to highlight, so I tell my students that whenever they build a chip from now on, they cannot use off-chip memory, right? Because remember, we talked about the memory wall, and we were going to build this von Neumann's dream of all chip, all memory and all compute on a single chip. We never want to go to off-chip memory because then all bits are off. And, you know, so that's wonderful. I, I, I told TSM, so that's what we are going to do. But TSM just said, oh, by the way, you know, given that you are a university and this is our first experiment with academia, we are only going to give you only two megabytes of on-chip resistive RAM, right? There goes my dream about building the dream chip that von Neumann wanted, because you know I wanted at least a 12 megabytes of on-chip resistive RAM to show ResNet 18, and TSMC give me only two megabytes, right? But beggars cannot be choosers, so I have to do something about that at that point, right? So the next part of the presentation is about that. What do I do about that? You know, to solve that beggars cannot be choosers problem. But before that. I am really excited about this announcement that Infineon and TSMC made last November. This really caught my attention. So, and many of you probably know about this thing. So they announced that for their automotive microcontrollers, they are going to replace their embedded flash with resistive RAM. And this is an active project. I think they, I think they wrote that by the end of 2023 or something like that, you know, they would have this available commercially. So you know, this, all this stuff that we are talking about, right? And, and they talk about this, that this is crucial for performance expansion, power consumption reduction, remember the 10X that I was talking about earlier, and so on and so forth. This is actually a wonderful, wonderful news for the whole community working on nanosystems, right? Because this is true. 
Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> so let's go back to this, you know, beggars cannot be choosers problem that I was talking about. You know, so, you know, I wanted to build a 12 megabytes, you know, on-chip memory, but TSMC gives me only two megabytes of on-chip memory. And that brings me to the x-axis of this next 3D mosaic that I was talking about earlier. So we have this kind of, you know, dense 3D chiplets, but we have to put all these chiplets together to build a system, right? So again, to recap, what are we talking about? We want a dream chip where we have all compute and all memory on a single chip easily accessible at a very low energy, right? And let's say the amount of memory that I need on chip is n times m. You will see why I have it as n times m. Essentially, the idea is that the full workload fits in the on-chip memory. But as I just said, that that's a moving target because first of all, beggars cannot be choosers. And number two, you know, even if you built that kind of a chip, somebody will have an application that requires even more memory, right? So what do you do about it? Now, one thing that I could do is the following. So let's say I can have only m amount of memory on chip and I have large off-chip memory of n minus one times m but that defeats the whole purpose, you know, the premise of this presentation, because now you have the memory wall, so that's not going to solve the problem. So here is the solution that we perform, and this is called illusion. Why is it called illusion? Because we are building an illusion of the dream chip, even though we cannot actually have uh, that dream chip. So how does this illusion system work? So instead of having all memory on a single chip, you have enough memory on each chip, number one. And number two, unlike today's systems where some chips can compute and some chips can store, now every chip can compute and every chip can store, as you can see over here. So if you have M amount of memory per chip and every chip can compute and every chip can store, then actually you build this system where the total amount of memory is still N times M, number one. But here is the key. You know, each chip cannot be wimpy. As I said, each chip must have enough memory, which is M. And the second requirement is that you can turn every chip on and off very quickly, something you can do with this emerging non-volatile memory such as resistive RAM. This combination, that actually allows you to create special mappings so that the inter-chip traffic is very sparse, number one. And number two, if you ever in a situation where you do not use one of the chips, it doesn't leak. So the overall idea is that if you take a computation graph, a large computation graph, the observation is that there are ebbs and tides of connections between the various nodes in the computation graph, which means for almost for any interesting computation graph, you can start with that full computation graph and you can actually cut at places where there are very little connectivity. Those cut sets are very small. And those cuts are the places where we connect the various chips and the various components that we are left with are the places where, you know, that are implemented on every chip. So with this kind of an architecture, instead of moving data, you move the compute where the data resides. And as long as the size of the result is significantly smaller than the amount of data you are crunching, you get massive benefits. And as a result, this kind of an illusion system is very different from traditional parallelization, and I will give you some examples. But before that, can you actually achieve this in hardware? And the answer is yes. By now, we actually have multiple systems that we have built. This was our Nature Electronics paper in the January 2021, uh, where actually uh, you know, we demonstrated you know, uh, an illusion. Why is it an illusion? Because the overall energy of the entire system, including the interchip traffic and so on, is within 5% of the dream chip that I could not build. And similarly, the overall execution time, the overall throughput of my entire system, including the interchip messages within 5% of the dream chip that I could not build. Which means that the overall energy delay product is within 10% of the dream chip that I could not build, which means that not only just from a functionality standpoint, I have created the dream chip, but also from a performance standpoint, from an energy and execution time standpoint, I have gotten very close to a dream chip that is impossible for me to build. And these are actual hardware prototypes, actual measurements that show that. So let's delve a little bit into the details of uh, this illusion system. As you can see that there are various kinds of mapping 
we call this illusion mappings because these are very different from traditional parallel processing mappings on this multi-chip system. Look at this beautiful mapping that you know, kind of you know, looks like a funny little you know, uh, structure. So, and we can show that all these mappings achieve this energy delay product that's very close to the dream chip within, you know, depending on how you look at it, within 10% or 90% of the dream chip. Not only that, we were able to show that these illusion mappings are an order of magnitude better compared to traditional parallel processing mapping. For example, NVIDIA published a paper called Simba in 2019 where they were also taking you know, these chiplets and they were actually mapping you know, AI workloads on these chiplets. But they had so much traffic for a 12 megabyte workload, for example, with two megabytes of on-chip memory, uh, following a parallel processing mapping, they would need, require 10 megabytes of traffic that's going between chips, which would be equivalent to, from an energy standpoint to going to off-chip memory, right? Versus we were able to achieve that as you could see, with only 1.5 megabytes of interchip traffic. So very significant improvements. And the point is, these kinds of illusion systems is ideal for AI workloads. You can read our Nature Electronics paper. I think it has, a, it has 50 pages of uh, appendices you know, that gets into the details and proofs and, you know, and theories and things like that, that why that is so. Now that I demonstrated this illusion, the question then boils down to is the following, that, you know, okay, so I actually demonstrated illusion for our Chimera chips and so on and so forth, so, you know, I could actually do a 12 megabytes of ResNet using two megabytes, you know, of on-chip memory given to me by, by TSMC, so I solved the beggars cannot be choosers problem, but does this really scale? So for example, if you take ResNet 18, you know, which was 12 megabytes, and let's say that it increases, you know, the neural net increases, you know, by, by, by 2x every generation. So after 10 generations, I have a 1,000x bigger neural net. Can I keep up with illusion? That is the question, right? To answer that question, to answer this question of illusion scale up, we have to think about what would happen roughly 10 years from now when we hit the miniaturization wall. So today, you know, like for the next 10 years, we will still have an exponentially growing number of devices on a single chip, right? That's kind of the classic Moore's law. But when that miniaturization stops, we are not going to get any exponential improvements. We are going to get linear improvements. For example, even if I do 3D, that I was talking about next 3D, I will increase the number of 3D layers linearly every generation, not exponentially, right? That's very hard. Similarly, if I look at you know, the interchip connectivity between various chiplets, that's going to improve linearly. If you look at energy per bit, if you look at throughput, that's going to improve linearly, right? So if you have all these linear improvements you know, in 10 years from now, uh, but I want to you know, you know, keep up with exponentially increasing workloads. So what do I do? So here comes the beauty of illusion. So you can mathematically prove this that all these linear improvements, you can actually multiply them given the way illusion works. So as a result, at an overall system level, you get a quadratic improvement even with this simple example, why? Because you are linearly increasing the number of 3D layers, that means you are linearly reducing the number of interchip messages for a given workload, and you are linearly improving the chip-to-chip -chip links, which means you are linearly improving power message cost. So they multiply, which means total message cost for a given workload improves quadratically, right? Now, if you have a quadratic improvement or if you have a, any high order polynomial improvement, you know, for a limited time range, you can actually always fit a quadratic with an exponential, right? So that sort of is the idea, and that actually gives rise to what is called illusion scale up. So as I was saying, that as the workloads keep growing, so you know, this is like today, and then you know, it, 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 it keeps growing like that, and these are all ISO EDP lines. Each of these lines are like 1.1x energy delay product of the corresponding bigger dream chip. And the key point is that you know, by you know, increasing, by, by this two-dimensional space, you can actually grow like this, and you're improving your bigger and bigger system, and you're keeping up illusion. Not only that, illusion is fungible, which means that you know, today, if you look at the industry, 
What is the industry talking about? They're mostly talking about chiplets. I'm sure in tomorrow's presentation from AMD, they will talk a lot about chiplets. And thus chipletization that the industry is pursuing today is mostly about cost. Oh, you know, I can build a die at a lower cost at an older node with a die, combine it with a die at a, you know, like a higher cost at a newer node and so on. But when miniaturization stops, you cannot just do that simple thing. And if you follow, what you have to do is illusion because you have to keep up with the energy delay product. But if you just simply pursue the x-axis, look at this, right? If you have a particular point over here, and if you want to go to the same point on the next EDP line, you have to have a massive improvement in you know, the x-axis interchip links. That's not happening by technology. Similarly, if you just did 3D, and if you did not want to pursue you know, this multiple 3D chiplets, then going from this line to this line, you need a lot of improvements in 3D. But actually, when you go diagonally along this line, you get a little improvement in 3D and a little improvement in the interchip links, you have the multiplicative benefit. And the multiplication is a very important property. And that's why you can follow this diagonal and you can keep up illusion. That's the key idea. Okay, so you know, as I was talking about, illusion is fungible, and that's what you get. So I'm near the end of this presentation, and I would like to say a few words, and then I would take uh, questions. So now that I have painted this picture of this next 3D mosaic, the thing is, how do you actually you know, obtain benefits with this next 3D mosaic, which means you have to do co-design. Now you have to combine techniques from the device level, circuit level, architecture level, algorithms level, and they must co cooperate for very large benefits. So that's a big nanosystems opportunity, especially for this crowd. Similarly, there are questions about how do you deal with thermal when you're talking about 3D. I won't have the time to talk about that uh, today in my presentation, but if you have a question, you can ask me either during the Q&A or you can catch me at the lobby. There are some truly cool uh, thermal solutions that are coming to play, and then of course, all the benefits that I was talking about, this 100x to 1000x, that's not taking into account software optimizations. So on top of this, you can get software optimizations to get even larger benefits. Uh, that's beyond the scope of this presentation. But let me show you one example of you know, co-design, and then I will tickle you with a second example. The first example is, remember that Chimera chip that I was talking about that TSMC asked me to build, right? with you know, resistive RAM and silicon CMOS. So I told them that in addition to this you know, AJI inference using illusion and stuff like that, we would also demonstrate AJI training. And especially we will be doing you know, what I call incremental training, which is like you, know, you have a neural net you know, that is pre-programmed and then you are tuning the weights of the neural net. And everybody that I you know, talked to about this, they rolled their eyes and they said, are you crazy? You are talking about resistive RAM. Any of these non-volatile memory technologies have problems with writes. It takes a lot of write energy, it takes a lot of latency, and most importantly, it has endurance problems, which means you can have only so many writes. And they were like, God bless you. You want to do stochastic gradient descent on this thing, this thing is going to die, either out of energy or out of reliability. So what are you going to do? And I said, well, you know, the people that came up with stochastic gradient descent, it's actually Barney Widrow. My you know, uh, colleague at Stanford, you know, he had the algorithm which is called LMS, and, you know, and an, uh, a reincarnation of that LMS algorithm from the 1960s is what is stochastic gradient descent today. You know, they didn't know that the rights are a problem for these memory technologies, and that's why you know, people have whatever algorithms they have, which does not mean that we might be able to achieve the same thing by having very few rights. And this is where the technique called low rank training came into place. I would let you read all the papers. But you know, one of the students came up with this low rank training algorithm with this ISO accuracy with drastically fewer rights, 100x fewer rights compared to stochastic gradient descent. And guess what? As a result, we were able to show in actual hardware 340x better energy delay product compared to stochastic gradient descent. And oh, by the way, 10 years of lifetime at 20 samples per minute. This is working in real life. And not only that, I will tickle you a little bit. You know, I won't get into details. At date 2023, which would be in Antwerp in April, we will actually demonstrate a similar thing where with a 
3D technology with carbon nanotubes, resistive ramps, silicon CMOS, and their monolithic 3D integration working in a foundry, we are going to show very large benefits even when you have ISO footprint and ISO memory capacity. You know, so watch out for that paper. The next three minutes that I have, you know, before I take uh, questions, you know, I would like to address this problem of cost because people ask me this question about cost. They say, oh, you know, what is about the cost per transistor of all this? And the way to think about cost is this notion of cost per transistor being the major driver, that was a thing of the 20th century. I actually call it 19th century as a joke because that was very manufacturing oriented. Versus today, what we are building is accelerators. You know, there, the cost per transistor is only one component of cost. And the real aspect of cost is system cost. And when you think of system cost, what do you have to think about? You have to think about design bugs, uh, pre-silicon verification, the way that we think of pre-silicon verification today, it's not working anymore. And as a result, there is a humongous number of bug escapes. And that's creating a lot of cost, especially for accelerators with enormous complexity and security. Uh, so we actually have techniques at Stanford. These are called QED or quick error detection-based techniques for new kinds of pre-silicon verification and post-silicon validation. Here is a collaborative work with Infineon where we looked at 16 Infineon automotive cores. And using our symbolic QED technique, not only were we able to find all bugs that Infineon found over five years, we actually found more bugs. But here is a real kicker, going from one design version to another, it took them six to nine person months of design verification versus we were able to accomplish that in two person days. A 60X improvement, that's the way to actually improve cost. Uh, you know, like beyond design bugs, there is this wonderful work by Professor Wolfgang Kunz and Dominic Stoffel from uh, University of Kaiserslautern, where they use pre-silicon verification techniques to derive new attacks. So no longer you have to hack into your design to be able to find things like spectra and meltdown and beyond. You know, the unknown, unknown attacks, they can find it during pre-silicon verification. So that's the way to address some of these cost issues. And the second aspect of cost is, this, is the fact that our manufacturing is totally messed up. Our manufacturing tests are not catching defective chips. And as a result, you will see these you know, papers from you know, Facebook, now Meta, and Google talking about you know, in the cloud, there's a massive number of chips that do not work. They are failing because of hardware defects. These are not because of software bugs or anything. This is because of hardware defects, because manufacturing testing is not catching these defective chips. And many of them are producing what are called silent errors, which means you do a computation, it produces a result, it does not provide any error indication, but the results are wrong. So how do you address that problem? So, you know, kind of, you know, you know 2008, at date 2008, so I have a lot of deep connections with Europe, you know, we had this paper called CASP, which stands for continuous testing in the field, uh, no longer being bound by, you know, manufacturing time testing. And, you know, at that time, there were lots of skeptics. They said, will this ever happen? You know, like, this is a crazy idea. Uh, versus I'm really proud that, you know, Intel actually in 2022, they announced this thing called Infield Scan uh, for the Sapphire Rapids products, you know, starting from that and many other companies. So these are the ways to actually reduce cost. So it's not the cost per transistor coming from technology, but new innovative techniques across the spectrum from circuits all the way to architectures and systems to reduce the system cost. I think that's the future. So I will end my presentation here and I will take questions. You can read the conclusions. You can build nanosystems today. They're working in industrial fabs. Next 3D mosaic and the illusion scale up is the key. And co-design of the right kind provides big opportunities. Thank you for your attention.